Health Committee to order, and I would ask uh, Councilor Crittenden to give the invocation, please. Father, I just want to thank you again for this day of life, this opportunity to meet together and to do our people's work. Father, the health of our nation and our tribe is critically important to us. I would pray, Father, that you'd bless us with continued health. Bless these folks here, these professionals that work in our different health departments and pro provide health for our people. I pray you'd bless them and, and guide them and help them do a good job. Father, I thank you for our country. I thank you for our tribe. I pray for our leaders. I pray for the chair this morning and each <coughs> committee member. Help us do our very best and, and provide good service and, and make good uh, uh, judgments and, 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 and provide the best for the people that we serve, Father. Go with us now and forgive us where we failed you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Next on the agenda is roll call. Bradley Cobb. Uh huh. Me. Bill Bill Anglin. Here. Bill John Baker. Jack Baker. Here. Harley Buzzard. Here. Julia Coates. Here. Joe Crittenden. Here. Jody Fishinghop. Here. Meredith Fraley. Don Garvin. Anna Glory Jordan. Present. Curtis Snell. Sure. Chris Soap. Aye. David Thornton. Kara Callan Watts. Aye. Next on the agenda, uh, approval of the March 11th minutes. I move to be approved. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Same sign. Uh, minutes are approved. Next on the agenda reports, first up is uh, Marty Smith and Clermore Service Units. Categories and priorities, uh, just uh, a document for your reference to, to have for, uh, for your own reference. And then I sent a copy of the, as of yesterday, the uh, uh, CEO of Claremore, the basic announcement is out. And I also made a copy of that and, and uh, uh, distributed it this morning for you to have uh, access to in case you haven't seen it. Uh, beginning with the uh, uh, accomplishments since the last meeting, um, our Claremore Diabetes Education Program uh, received recertification by the uh, IHS Integrated uh, Diabetes Recognition Program. Uh, I think that's, I believe that's, uh, it is a three-year recertification. And uh, the Claremore program is also certified by the American Diabetic Association. Um, we had a, one of our doctors who is a radiologist, Dr. Back, uh, recently received a national recognition by uh, the Osteopathic Founders uh, Foundation. 
has their Outstanding Physician Award. And most of uh, the write-up that I read, kind of in summary, his award was given to a large degree because of his uh, contribution to teaching uh, residents and training residents. And he's done, I believe it was like uh, 54 residents and several medical students over the years. So... Uh, we're very proud to see that he uh, received that award. Also, um, our congestive heart failure clinic at Claremore, uh, which is uh, pharmacy managed, uh, works. They work with our internal medicine physicians to manage the congestive heart failure patients, and uh, they uh, one of the pharmacists that uh, is the. Uh, Tim Murray, who is uh, the primary pharmacist responsible for starting the service, uh, received an award from the American Pharmaceutical Association. And uh, there was actually a write-up in the Tulsa World. We installed EHR version 1.1 on March the 12th. It was relatively uneventful. Uh, We had just a maybe 30 minutes of issues that we had to resolve on individual computers, but for the most part, it did not interrupt patient care. Um, We also made a um, upgraded um, RPMS server in March. Uh, We were getting at a dangerous level on storage, and um, the upgrade will give us about four times the capacity. We didn't buy new machines. We just put new hard drives in. The last item that I have under accomplishments kind of moves into the new initiative thing also, but it's follow-up on the OB plan, uh, kind of the status of that. Uh, At the moment, we have uh, the floors in the rooms and the walls have been re-renovated. We, uh, because of the the speed at which we're moving, uh, we, we've decided to bring in a contractor for the bathroom so that we could achieve it in a little uh, better timetable. And uh, hopefully uh, by this time, by this next meeting, uh, we'll, for the most part, have those rooms uh, near in completion. We're also... Um, our chief nurse executive is also uh, coordinating and being sure we have all the uh, equipment and furniture for the room. So those are, are very uh, near completion. As far as the CAT scan, um, as most of you know from my last report, the really the issue is not whether we need another CAT scan or not. The issue is whether how... Um, whether to get a 16 slice or a 32 slice or 64 slice, we're, we're still recommending a 64 slice. Um, the people in the area office are looking at the technical requirements. And uh, we have a meeting on April the 25th, an imaging group. Uh, we'll probably most likely discuss it at that meeting again. And Dr. Motley and, and Kathy Smith are radiology tech are trying to coordinate a uh, visit with uh, <coughs> John Ferris in Oklahoma City uh, to look at the technology at some uh, existing hospitals so that we make the right decision on which one to get. Um, as far as announcements, as you know, Dr. Cheek is now at Claremore in internal medicine. Um, uh, we recently uh, hired a uh, new nurse executive. She will actually be uh, the assistant to the nurse executive. And uh, Elaine Pearson, she comes from Oklahoma City. Um, her first day at work was yesterday, so we have lots of work for her to do. The position's been vacant for a few months. And, uh, we also uh, acquired Travis Scott, who's in the room today as the uh, ambulatory care director. Uh, Travis has already been very busy with looking at uh, appointment processes and issues and at patient flow issues, so he's got a lot of work ahead of him. Uh, thought I would introduce him. You want to stand up, Travis, so that those that don't know who you are? Uh, he's 
should prove to be a real valuable resource to Claremore. Um, we had a site visit by Senator Coburn on uh, March 26th, and this was kind of a pretty short notice uh, type of visit, but his staff, he had three staff members that visited the facility, and um, primarily they seemed interested in the uh, just touring the facility and, uh, and discussing the jurisdictional issue or issues. And um, of course, we took the opportunity to talk to them about uh, also about the CHS issues that we always are dealing with, uh, the lack of being able to accommodate all the patient needs through the CHS system. That's um, pretty much what they were interested in when they came to the facility. Um, our statistics, uh, I listed those on the, on the back. One thing I added in there was the new charts just to give you some concept as to the uh, number of new charts that we're seeing. We're still down on outpatient visits because of um, our staffing levels, but we're, we had recently had a site visit by an OB physician, and we had a nurse practitioner that uh, came and visited the site, and an emergency medicine physician. So um, we're hoping to make some hires on on uh, physicians soon. Um, I think it was Councilman Soap that mentioned at the first meeting I was at about a patient pamphlet uh, explaining like the CHS mechanism and that sort of thing. Um, we ordered 2,500 of those yesterday uh, to try to uh, distribute to new patients so that they're familiar with some of the um, policies and processes of the hospital and that sort of thing. And um, of course, I, I, I added in this time the prescription volume and the lab volume only because it kind of gives you a perspective uh, um, as to the volume of those services. Those are two very uh, busy services. And um, it's, it even surprised me when I saw that we did that many lab tests a day in, inside our own facility. But I thought that might um, be interesting to see. Our amount um, billed this month and collected, our collections were actually up. You know, last month was the first month that they had been down uh, from the beginning of the fiscal year. They're back up this month, so we're efficiently uh, billing. We just need to get our visit counts up, and hopefully uh, we're looking also at a, I, I don't think I've mentioned this, uh, we're also looking at the possibility of an automated uh, uh, appointment reminder system so that we don't have as many no-shows or missed appointments and that type of thing. Um, and, of course, as far as CHS, um, we probably the big thing is if we get reimbursed for the uh, cases uh, that we've submitted, the chef cases, <laughs> which uh, we, we uh, submit those for reimbursement through area office. They're the real high-cost cases. And um, we, we have submitted, uh, and that's actually uh, a couple of weeks old, that number, but 568000 uh, If we're able to uh, reclaim that, we'll be able to use those funds for other CHS cases. So we're kind of waiting on that reimbursement. I believe Councillor Callan Watts has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I find uh, your comment on contract sales compelling since for four or five years I've asked Indian Health Service for those numbers mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that our Rogers County Cherokees as well as Washington and Tulsa and I think part of Czech hospitals <laughs> are treated differently. Efficiency differences between us being able to tribally run and self-govern that contract health. We would love to take that responsibility and address those issues that I think all of us address, but we, we don't get that information from Indian Health Service. And it's been frustrating for me personally. 
So I don't know what we can do, that the officers can do at the Indian, at Claremore Indian Hospital um, to make sure and facilitate that information. But for a good four years, I've been working on that issue. Excuse me, I'm not sure I understand what information. We'd like, I, I think we should compact or self-determine those monies the same as we've done with Hastings, at least a portion of it. And I think we could address a lot of those issues. It, it's, you know, I, I told someone this morning, and, and I can honestly say this, is it's probably more frustrating to me, or as frustrating as it is to everyone in this room, because the system is just not fair, and, and uh, there's not enough funds. We, we tell everybody that we come in contact with uh, that, you know, because there's a lot of unmet needs and patient. Uh, we have every month. You know, we have patients that don't get the care, that can't afford to get the care that they need because of the CHS priority system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Smith. Councilor Buzzard. Uh, Marty, last month I inquired about the Blue Cross, Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance. I'm not sure that I'm directing this to the right person, but anyway, uh, my question was is uh, at different Different people within the Cherokee Nation, like uh, Cherokee Nation uh, Industries, uh, Cherokee Nation uh, Enterprises, and the Cherokee Nation itself, all have Blue Cross and Blue Shield, but yet uh, we get charged different rates when we go to different uh, providers. I don't know if this is a question for you to answer or someone else, because uh, Mr. Patello, uh, Mr. Chairman, is supposed to bring back information that uh, what we pay for deductibles, and we don't have that. Councilor Fishinghawk asked for some uh, information, and we don't have that. But, Marty, I guess what I'm asking you is, uh, do you know of any cases that why uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield pays different uh, <coughs> different prices between pharmacy items is what I'm really know about. Well, um, as, as you said, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Well, no. But, uh, that, but what I can... Do. What I can certainly do is, you know, you might seek the answer from the HR, I guess, people uh, uh, that, that were here last time. And then also I will try to get an update from our staff on how it's handled at Claremore and, and report back, uh, like, uh, within 72 hours or something like that. I'll... Uh, <coughs> Uh, can you can you uh, make the difference or show the difference between the Cherokee Nation Blue Cross Blue Shield plan and the Cherokee Nation Enterprises plan? I will okay. attempt to do that. That's all I need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think Ms. Garrett has a comment on this. Um, I just was, uh, as I got, I wasn't here last month, so I went through the minutes. And as I reviewed those, this question was in there. And I think Mr. Batello was actually at the meeting and got up and talked a little bit about even though we're, we bid our insurances together, each entity has its own plan design. Um, and I think it was requested that he send those plan design or the, the matrix, so to speak, over about the differences. I called him to see if he had done that, and he said yes. Did you all get that? Or? On. Some are shaking their head yes, and some are shaking their head no. Yeah, real I got a packet in the mail, I believe it was. As I recall, seeing the matrix of all of the different entities with okay. each individual health care plan and benefits package. Box at the council house. Well, if, if, if you still need something else, I'll be glad to call him and get it over here. And I can call him now and see if he can bring it over, but... I think there's a, that was my follow-up, and that should answer yeah. uh, Harley's questions. Yeah. I didn't get it in my back or something. I think there's a few counselors that, that are raising their hands. I think, would like to have a few copies of that, if at all possible. Um, I would like to have a few, if at all possible. I think, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes. If they will send those to Shelley or to Gail, probably Gail, she distributes most of the information. Or either Shelley, <clears throat> it would help a lot because some of us didn't get that information. 
Well, I didn't. I don't know where he sent it, but I asked Ida to call over there and see if we can get copies right now. Because it's copies they have on hand. Next is Councilor So. Ms. Murray, I've got a question, that, uh, and actually it's come up several times uh, talking to various constituents, calling, uh, you know, uh, seeking uh, advice or help, where uh, uh, either themselves or a family member has been involved in some type of uh, incident that has rendered them either semi-conscious or unconscious. Uh, the uh, ambulance is called. The patient is transported to the uh, a medical facility uh, via ambulance, and in doing so, um, in, in the particular county that I represent, they're essentially uh, designated to a facility. Um, with you know, and, and then once that uh, visit or the, the emergency room visit takes place, uh, then they once they become conscious, they have a choice and they say, "Hey, I really don't want to be here." Because it's costing me a lot of money. That can you please transport me to uh, Claremore to where I, uh, you know, can get assistance with um, the health care? Can you um, just provide some examples of what those uh, patients' rights are as regards to, um, you know, how do you make a decision if you're not conscious or semi-conscious to tell the ambulance uh, driver to what facility you need to go to? Uh, because uh, it, it would, you know, in, in, in the uh, a normal person's mind, you know, if they're being transported to a facility via a uh, hospital that's not a scheduled transport, that's an emergency to them. And then when they request assistance from either, I guess, IHS or the Cherokee Nation, then the, uh, the, those claims are being denied because they're saying that this was not an emergency situation. And there's a little bit of confusion there, and it's happened several times, and it's, it's, it's a little bit surprising to me that it's, you know, it does happen. I'm sure that if I'm hearing about it, it happens more frequently than that. And so what 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 uh, can someone do in that? I mean, do, do they need to wear a wristband that says, you know, take me to Claremore, or, or what's the option? Because these people are hardworking people, and, you know, they're, and now they're in situations to where their checks are being garnished at work and stuff like that because they're going to be able to pay pay for a uh, you know, primary care hospital visit to the emergency room. You know, once again, that's a, that's a tough one. Hopefully it's not only happening, happening with Claremore, but I could see those type of situations. I might, I know part of your question is, you know, when can the doctor, when, when can they decide they want to be somewhere else? Uh, I'd probably be better served if I let, I brought Dr. Modley with me just to answer these kind of questions. Or maybe even uh, Dr. Grimm as a physician could better answer those type of questions, you know, because uh, we, there's other factors involved too, like uh, the levels of care that the hospital offers and, and, and Talent, whether you're trying to move from a higher level of care to a lower level of care, and, right. and that time. seems like that first decision that's made by the, the uh, ENTs to to, to uh, transport. I've been in, involved in several situations to where, you know, I've just been a, a bystander that's, that's that's along for the ride, and they ask me, "Where do you want to take them?" And I'm like, "What are you asking me for?" You know, I mean, what's and then I'm all of a sudden the decision maker for this individual. And it just seems a little odd, so I'm trying to understand that whole process to where, um, you know, once they decide that you're going to, to uh, uh, Mays County Medical Center, then you're obligated to at least probably, I would assume, a $5,000 uh, uh, bill that may or may not be picked up by the Cherokee Nation that, that, that primarily you're responsible for. And I'm just trying to understand that so we can communicate to, to our tribal members to say, is there anything we need to be wary of, or, or should we just go to the to the uh, mess and say, look, if, you know, if, if, if you need the profile or whatever, you know, how do you ask an unconscious person if they need to be delivered to Claremore so you know they don't get their check garnished at work or something? Like yeah, that? well, you know, obviously when it's life threatening, you have to get them to, you know, to, you have to save the patient's life um, if it's a life threatening situation no matter what, but 
Um, Dr. Molly, do you like to comment on that? Sure. I don't know that I can answer all your questions, <laughs> but I do know that uh, the ambulance services, as you know, have protocols and the person's on, unconscious, they're either going to call a helicopter or take them to the nearest ER station on a lot of times auto accident, and that's the state uh, trauma protocol, and they're going to fly them to Tulsa. The main, if they're unconscious, the main thing, the family can also call and contact help to know about it. They've only got 72 hours to right. do that. That's one thing. And then another part of this question, I think, dealt more with in Tala, which is a law that, as you know, has to do with transfer to higher levels and lateral transfer. And, uh, it, it is possible to, for the patient to transfer to, uh, for instance, Claremore, but that's a doctor's doctor decision and it's primarily the doctor with the patient that has control of the situation and he would decide that they need to go to a higher level because it's against the law to do what they call lateral transfer which means to a, a, a hospital with a similar uh, capability of care. However, if the patient stabilized, the patient can ask to transfer over to us and we encourage that. In fact, this morning, one of the reminders in our uh, triad meeting was to have the physician call us because we're glad to save those contract dollars if we can take care of them. So those are the two things. We did have a meeting, I know, here several months ago with Chair of the Nation, EMS, and we discussed just this issue, and that is, you know, we would like to have a patient brought over to us, however, uh, they wound up in Arkansas or somewhere else. And uh, so that, that had been discussed and from time to time over, over the years. But those are the two things I don't know that I doubt that I've answered all of Yeah, you've answered uh, a lot of the questions. And that's what I think the, the, in the several cases that I've been made aware of, those types of uh, uh, additional decisions have been made post that initial determination of where are you going to the hospital. And I think that the conflict is is that is that the, the, the uh, transport service may deem it as an emergency because they're not or the person's not able to respond and it's that initial, you know, five thousand dollar obligation that whenever they say, Hey, what am I doing here? I need to be over at Claremore because I don't want my medical expenses to you know go to twenty thousand dollars. That, that's the, 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 the focal point that I would like to focus on. And maybe I can send you some details of this latest uh, uh, issue that's been raised with me and, and you know you can look at it and make a determination. But I just see that as you know something that, that me personally have uh, came across uh, you know several times. I was like, hey, there's a reoccurring theme. Is it just uh, isolated to, to my particular uh, county or is this something that impacts the nation at large? So I, just, I was just curious on what, what rights or what awareness do people need to be made that, you know, I think that one thing I'm trying to raise awareness is the 72 hour window period that, hey, if you've had any type of uh, medical uh, procedures done or something, you need to start, you know, getting on the phone and not after your check's being garnished six months later. So, thank you. Hopefully, uh, on that, just that one issue, the awareness issue, the 72 hours. Um, Notice um, we concluded that in our patient pamphlet. And I'll get you. A, I'll send a copy of that. Hopefully, we're going to uh, be distributing those to all the new new patients. I have a question. There, there may be some on the council that actually know this um, and have access to this, but I would like to see. Um, and the next committee meeting is fine. On the handout that, that you gave us uh, in your preference, um, I had the pleasure um, of testifying in front of Health and Human Services in D.C. It became painfully apparent that they don't recognize the difference between federally recognized tribe and state recognized tribe. I would like to see the uh, uh, Health and Human Services Indian preference section on hiring. I want to know if it's, and my question is going to be, is this specifically state? that Indian preference is tied to federally recognized tribe. So the next meeting could I have, and I don't need the whole thing, but I want that section. 
Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any more questions? Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Next on our agenda is Ed McElmore from Hastings. I believe Ed is out of the country, <laughs> as, as I heard, I think. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kathy Holcroft, and I'm the Chief Nurse at Hastings. And it's my privilege to report to the council this morning in Mr. McElmore's stead, who is in travel status and he regrets that he cannot be here. I think that uh, everyone was provided with a um, summary of this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. What is your last name? Holcroft. H O L C R O F T. Um, of the uh, information that was provided, um, I'll just summarize, and, and then if you have questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Um, the equipment for the lap band, as you saw, is here, and uh, we are scheduling the um, surgical procedure proctoring around the 1st of June, so that service should be offered then after that time. Um, Dr. Blue and the staff there are excited and prepared to offer this new service uh, with the hopes that eventually uh, a reduction in weight and uh, good balanced dietary nutrition will prevent a lot of the uh, chronic diseases that the uh, Native Americans have and reduce some of the uh, cost for medications for those patients and some of the chronic underlying diseases that is associated with uh, obesity. Um, we had our CAP survey. It was a, a good, very successful survey for the lab, and um, we're glad that that's gone and under our belt and we can move on. Uh, we've had some visitors uh, looking at our business process, and uh, they were from Lawton, and this is just a few of the many that have come there to see our business process to see what they can do to increase their third-party revenue. Um, we have a new audiologist coming on the 28th, and we're excited about that. That's been a service that's been uh, that we've been without for just a little while, and we're glad to get that person on board. I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Merrill, who is our performance improvement um, director now. He was um, selected and hit the floor running. It's a it's a big job, and. Uh, I'm sure that there's a large learning curve there for him, but uh, he's a quick study, and I'm sure he'll do a fine job. Uh, the patient advocate position has been filled with Star Lynch, and uh, we're glad to get that position filled so that the patients have a name and a person that they can rely on to come if they do have complaints. Hopefully, we're going to be proactive in that area, though, and. Uh, uh, have a lot of um, risk management going on so that those complaints are far and few in between. I'd also, in case you don't know, I'd like to introduce Dr. Doug Nolan. Uh, he is our acting clinical director at this time uh, because of a leave of absence that our uh, uh, clinical director has taken, Dr. Brenda Ferris. So, Stand by. Okay. <laughs> All right. And he's doing a fine job. We're glad to have him working with us. Um, we have um, our middle order pharmacy that's still in progress. It's, it's uh, being um, scrutinized in area office, and hopefully they'll have a decision for the contract soon. Um, our strategic planning has been kind of on hold just for further discussions with Cherokee Nation. And uh, we've had our, our uh, planning committee meet and for the performance, um, periodic performance review, which is due into joint commission on the 21st. Uh, the announcements for meetings you can read. We are on target uh, to make uh, uh, our third party collections our goal reality. We're ahead of the game right now as compared to last year, so we're excited about that. Sorry for a short report, but that's all I know, but I'll be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions, Mr. Council? The uh, lap band surgery, is that covered uh, by Blue Cross Blue Shield? Yes, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
We have put into place a clinic. Uh, most of the uh, insurance uh, entities require that they go through some type of weight loss program, and we also have that in place at Hastings now so that they can go through the program, see if they can actually lose weight on their own. If not, then they'll be referred to the lab and uh, surgery. It is not covered by Cherokee Nation, Blue Cross Blue oh, Shield Insurance. That's, that's what I was uh, asked. Our, our, our plan document right. does not cover lap banding or gastric bypass. Other Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, this ours does not. Right. CNE does. Right. And that's why we've been well supporting in helping patients trying to get the program done. Right. Okay. <coughs> Any more questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Next on our agenda is Melissa Gower, Cherokee Nation Health Services. Good morning, everyone. Um, you have a, um, I think you have a packet on access to recovery, and I just wanted to take a minute. You had requested some information about some of the behavioral health programs, and so Dr. Gastor um, uh, sent over uh, a couple of handouts on the Access to Recovery Program, which is the direct treatment program, um, and then a couple of fact sheets on our methamphetamine program. Um, and the, our Access to Recovery Program is actually called the Many Paths Program. So you have information on that. One announcement is that um, on April the 21st, which is Monday, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., um, Dr. Wesley Clark, um, the Director of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration out of Washington, D.C., um, will be here for a site visit. Um, we will be in the council chambers from 10 to 12 for our kickoff, and then we're having a lunch out in the foyer from 12 to 1. And so we would like to extend an invitation to you uh, to attend either either one of those events or both. Um, the um, second thing I have is um, our PACE program. I wanted to give a short um, update and invite for that. Um, our application has been approved by the state of Oklahoma and is in Baltimore, Maryland at CMS headquarters. Um, once it goes to CMS there, they have a 90-day time period to approve or modify that application. Um, we can't foresee any issues with it. It took us, um, by the time it gets through the state, it's been scrutinized so much that um, there usually are no issues at the national level. Um, that was sent at the middle of March, so their 90-day clock is ticking and um, would be over around the middle of June. So we're anticipating uh, being able to um, start taking patients um, around July the 1st uh, in that PACE program. And the invitation that I want to give you is that we're um, having um, an open house on April the 24th at 2 o'clock p.m. at the PACE site. Um, after we get open later in the fall, we'll have a grand opening, but we're going to go ahead and have an open house because we're trying to get people familiar with the program. And, uh, about once a, um, every two weeks, we have a, a noon hour luncheon thing where people bring brown, uh, brown bag lunches and providers from the community to, to get them get familiar with the program. So that's the announcement that an update I want to give on the PACE program. Um, the next one that I have an announcement on in an update is on um, the Marcoma Recreation Center. Um, we have a, um, this is a pretty much final sheet, so uh, we're, we have reviewed this and made a lot of changes to it, but I wanted to hand you this information sheet. We anticipate... Um, currently, it's under renovation.
renovation. The weight room is framed and ready to sheetrock. The plumbing updates have started. The central heat and air has been started. Um, the exercise equipment has begun to be delivered. Um, we have been interviewing for staffing. Um, one side of the indoor walking tunnel is completed. Um, we plan to uh, be open Monday through Thursday, 5.30 a.m. to 9 p.m., Friday 5.30 to 7, Saturday 8 to 5, and Sunday 12 to 5. Um, Cherokee tribal citizens, including their spouse and dependent children, will be free of charge. Cherokee Nation entity employees, including their spouse and dependent children, are free of charge. Non-Cherokee citizen community members for an individual is $20 a month and for the family is $30 a month, which would include their spouse and dependent children. We will have nationally certified personal trainers on duty there um, that will assess individual needs for physical activity, nutrition, health promotion, and develop personalized plans for effective physical activity. Um, the, um, we'll have a variety of cardiovascular training equipment, and you can see some of the examples there and strength training equipment. Um, we'll have specialty physical activity classes, including yoga, aerobics, kickboxing, and core training. We'll have on-site child care. Um, our recreation leagues for both adults and children, for including basketball, softball, soccer, and Cherokee stickball. We'll have health promotion classes for smoking cessation, healthy cooking, senior fitness and nutrition, and walking and running classes. Um, we're trying to make this facility... Um, we're trying to make the facility so that uh, it encourages um, people to make better healthy choices for themselves and try to take away the barriers, um, which are usually time and money and um, access and those kinds of things. So we hope that this will be a success and hope that you all <clears throat> take a personal challenge in encouraging all of your family and friends um, that are not currently getting physical activity to um, go to the program and um, get on a plan to see if we can, and that includes me, and I'll plan on doing that, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, the uh, last thing I have is that um, the, uh, as you know, on uh, it's an update on our um, Hastings project. Um, on January 15th, we announced our intent to enter into a self-governance planning process for Hastings Indian Hospital, and the intent of the planning process was for uh, the delivery of a comprehensive, seamless health care delivery system for northeastern Oklahoma. <clears throat> there were um, 21 planning teams um, identified for each discipline, and each one of those teams had representatives from Hastings Hospital and from Cherokee Nation um, that were all appointed by Indian Health Service in Oklahoma City. <clears throat> uh, the teams were given five tasks uh, to complete over a five-week period. Um, the, um, overall, the members of the planning teams were very positive. Um, and look forward to the many opportunities that this endeavor will bring our citizens. Um, and Gloria is handing out a sheet that gives you a brief summary of each of the findings of the team. Um, based on the recommendations of the planning team, um, Cherokee Nation Health Services will enter into um, negotiations for a self-governance compact for the services at Hastings Hospital. Uh, which will create a compre comprehensive health care system that provides improved services to our patients and allows our providers to more efficiently coordinate patient care. Um, we will transfer all positions at Hastings to either federal or tribal employment. There are about 600 positions there. <clears throat> all of those will be uh, retain their federal employment um, except for a little over a hundred which is not eligible for federal employment and they will be given tribal employment. Um, we, it, this is all done um, to create a comprehensive health care system that will save money and time by eliminating multiple layers of federal bureaucracy. Um, this decision um, 
was based on many factors. One of those is recommendations from the planning teams. Two is that by assuming the operations, we will create a comprehensive health care system that provides improved service to our patients and allows our providers to coordinate patient care. Um, and also to create the comprehensive health care system by saving money and time uh, by eliminating the layers of federal bureaucracy. Some of the uh, issues that were <clears throat> identified <clears throat> which will be addressed by consolidation of the health care system. Um, one is that the Indian Health Service has many obstacles to recruiting personnel. The time it takes to fill a position's a uh, position can sometimes be up to six months or longer, which means a decline in services provided because of those vacant positions. Um, primarily, the HR function there is performed out of the Oklahoma City area office and not performed locally. For professional staff, they are not allowed to do letters of intent or make any commitments on the spot, whereas Cherokee Nation performs all human resources functions locally in Tahlequah and the process to fill a position is much shorter and prefer, for professional staff and we can issue letters of intents and make commitments immediately on the spot. Um, the Indian Health Service has a very time consuming process for contracts and has a dictation of contractors. Um, we have the ability to issue contracts to the best firms and to a variety of firms uh, we do follow Indian preference and we do have a process to issue a contract, but even with that, it is much less burdensome than Indian Health Service process. And we also have the ability to negotiate contract fees. Um, currently, we operate the entire contract health services department in Hastings, um, and operating the direct care would make this process much more efficient and smooth. Um, the administrative cost um, for Hastings Hospital uh, would be decreased through some efficiencies. Um, the amount of dollars currently available for patient care there is currently limited to direct funding, federal funding, and third-party resources. Um, the Cherokee Nation would be able to add uh, a variety of other revenue streams. Want to thank you. One of those that um, you're very familiar with is in health services we've been very aggressive about getting federal grants and I just went over about 30 million dollars of federal grants in behavioral health that we've been able to to access and currently a federal program cannot apply or access federal grants and so that's a whole new revenue stream that we would be able to apply and access is grant money. The um, um, of course, we know that um, change is sometimes uncomfortable and even scary for some people. Um, so we are uh, doing, making every effort to provide um, information and communication and a level of comfort. Um, we hope to be able to provide an improved work environment uh, where their focus can be more on patient care and not so much on uh, processing paperwork. Our time frame um, is uh, next fiscal year. Um, our negotiations with Indian Health Service will uh, take place in May and June. And um, Kara's not, oh yeah, there you are. I just wanted to also mention in that part is that um, we have notified <coughs> them um, that we expect to have contract health information for Claire more available so that we can do negotiations for that at the same time. Um, the, uh, F, the fiscal year 2009 budget for the operation, of course, will be forthcoming to the Tribal Council um, for your approval process. There are um, a couple of things that um, we found through our planning process that the teams actually identified. Um, one of those is some um, immediate equipment needs that um, needs to happen to um, ensure that the services um, can be offered more efficiently. One of those is robotics for their pharmacy. Uh, we have robotics in our pharmacy. It decreases um, 
the waiting time, the time to refill prescriptions, um, the um, staff uh, usage is is much better, um, and their pharmacy workload at Hastings is very high, and they really need robotics there. Um, also, uh, mammography, they have never offered mammography services. We do have mammography in three of our clinics, and, and we would like to offer mammography services there. And there is some radiology equipment there that is, uh, needs to be updated. Um, the total approximate cost of the immediate equipment needs would be about $3 million. We currently have not identified funding for that but um, we may be able to identify some of that funding through the negotiation process, so I can keep you updated on that. The second one is that for facility upgrades, there's about $3.7 million, including um, heating, air conditioning, control system upgrade, a chiller replacement, parking lot upgrade, uh, lightning and security upgrade. Funding has been identified um, for those projects from federal sources through maintenance and improvement projects through Oklahoma area and headquarters. Um, so we will receive funding to do those upgrades. We had a, an independent um, financial uh, person that um, does a, um, I mean their whole business is around uh, Indian Health Service and, and tribes uh, assuming those operations to do a a, a review of this so that we could um, uh, independently make some financial uh, conclusions and um, he visited with um, Cali Catcher, um, he was here last week, and um, went through the finance process and um, the, as you know, contract support cost is a um, cost that pays for indirect services. Um, two tribes for um, self-governance activities. Um, and that is a line item that um, Congress does not usually um, fund or appropriate funds for. Um, so part of uh, what, he and what he did was to go through and um, make an analysis if we would be able to uh, absorb and be able to pay those indirect costs to the tribe. Um, and, our, and his analysis was that we can do that um, through various means in the budget. Um, also, there were um, a couple of things that were um, identified that um, we needed to retain with Indian Health Service. And um, I know that um, um, in, in a previous conversation, you know, we talked about are there things that um, Indian Health Service can get cheaper or, or better that we wouldn't be able to access. And we have determined there that there are some contracts in particular that they have that are area-wide contracts which serves the whole Oklahoma area and so those are at very good rates. Under self-governance, um, what you can do and have the option under the law to do is to buy back, retain and buy back those services. So there will be some of those things that we will want to Indian Health Service to retain and us buy those back. Um, and we can work all those out during the negotiation process. I know one off the top of my head is, the, is their reference laboratory. Um, <clears throat> they have a really good price on that, so that's a contract that we will want Indian Health Service to continue with and us buy back that service. Um, I think that's all I have. I'll be glad to um, entertain any questions. Councilman Buzzer has a question. <clears throat> well, I'm not going to go that. Yeah. Oh, I know. Dr. Home, uh, the mm -hmm. exercise building stuff, uh, Melissa, is that mm -hmm. funded through Healthy Nations uh, dollars? It's general fund. A general fund? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess my other comment about that is it's fine and dandy. You know, we have Mr. Baker. And Ms. Jordan here from Tahlequah, but I think the other council members out here in the district would like to see some of that funding up there, so I'd like for you to keep that in mind. I know at the day clinic we have a really, really small uh, workout facility there for those people there and, and some of the community members, but 
I, not speaking for the other council members, but I'd certainly like to see some of those dollars uh, be spread out into our community a little bit more, too, because we have the same need there as we do here in Cherokee County. Thank you. Well said. Yes. Well said. <laughs> We get dental at Salina. We'll get to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you reminded her. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to Zillian Bartlesville after that. How's yeah. that? <laughs> uh, Councillor Baker has a question. Yes. Yeah. A couple of three. Okay. Uh, the first one does have to do with with outside of Tahlequah uh, healthcare or uh, exercise equipment stuff. Uh, do you know anything about them pulling the donated uh, exercise equipment from the Lost City community? Uh, building. There's, there's a little community building next to the school, next to the Head Start that we partnered and helped them build and then put exercise equipment and, and now the stir in the community that we're coming after. I know nothing. And a lot of the community the elders use it and... and uh, I know nothing. Can we find out? Sure, I'll be glad to. It's a, a whole it's in, it's, there's some exercise equipment that's yeah. inside of the community building. Treadmill, a bicycle. No, no, there's not a lot, but but uh, but a lot of those community members, and it, it was kind of a, a diabetes uh, type it's initiative. Six, six or seven years ago. At least. Yeah. And now we're going to jerk it out. And uh, so some of the, the elders and stuff are, are really okay. worrying why the Cherokee Nation has been so mean to them. We'll find that out and let you know as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, the, I know you said that uh, uh, indirect cost is not something that they normally fund, but, but right oh. now they just have a moratorium on it. They do fund it, but there's a moratorium on it, which might not be the best time to think about taking it when there's a more firm on any new or expanded services uh, for indirect costs. Right. It's, for the contract support cost, the moratorium is on new and expanded. So um, they do fund it. It's just not very much funding. And so what happens is when it goes, uh, there's actually a cap on it, what it's called. Uh, so when it goes to um, Indian Health Service, then you're in a queue, so to speak, and they make a decision, like the decision might be 50% of it goes to the new and expanded programs, and they also have some money in the Office of Tribal Self-Governance that can go to toward new and expanded, and then half of it will go to the queue. Because even though we have some contract support costs on some of our programs, they're not 100% funded. And so you stay on the queue to get that additional monies each year. Uh, and then our tribal shares will mm -hmm. be tied up for at least 18 months? Um, I mean, they're in salaries and, and things like that right now. Well, um, they have... Um, I wish uh, somebody from self governance was in here. Uh, Melanie's oh. here. Can you answer these self governance sure. questions? Because <laughs> I don't want to give wrong information. <laughs> On tribal shares, that's a good question because um, a while back, and it's been several years ago, there was a business plan work group that talked about the liquidity of tribal shares, and I think that's what you're talking about. That if tribal shares is currently funding some federal staff at the area office and headquarters, how can they give us the cash? And uh, the way it happens now is that um, what the area will do is that they'll request money from the self-governance office who has shortfall dollars. Those shortfall dollars will come and supplant basically those tribal shares so that those can be freed up to be paid to the tribe. So at this point, we're looking at getting 100% of our tribal shares starting in fiscal year 09 rather than being phased in in the old days. So. And then I answered his first question. Um, on the um, IDC uh, funding, it's more a matter of appropriations than it is a moratorium. Um, the appropriations just haven't been there for contract support costs. And when they do get appropriations, they get seven to nine million dollars for the whole nation as an increase. And then they choose, as Melissa indicated, where to put that, if that's going to be new and expanded or if that's going to be for ongoing shortfalls for ongoing programs. And um, 
what we would be doing is doing several things on several different fronts to ensure that we're in the best position to get some of that money. One would be uh, encourage IHS to put it in new and expanded, part of which we would be the biggest player in that if uh, once Hastings comes online. Uh, two would be to, to lobby for new appropriations, obviously, which we've been doing on an ongoing basis. And then three, there's a, an approach that we've um, talked with Senator Coburn about, and he's been um, uh, very positive about, and that is redirecting IHS unobligated funds for the last several years back to contract support costs to fund these shortfalls. And we would have support from Alaska tribes on that, a lot of other tribes that are experiencing those kind of shortfalls, and that kind of approach has good possibility of getting through. So we're working on all those fronts to make sure that that shortfall lasts as short as possible. Um, but in year one, the way we've done our financial planning is to be very conservative and to say, if we were to receive not a dollar, could we still make this work and could we do a good job at it? And we think the answer is yes to those questions. Um, and I'm sure we'll lobby the Black Caucus on all this. <laughs> um, the which is, I guess, I guess the next question is for Kelly. You know, you've identified six or three million dollars that you need to come up with, and uh, right now in the Gen Fund we've got a million thirty-eight, of which a million, the chief is asking for the Freedman Defense Fund, and so that's thirty-eight thousand dollars in Gen Fund, and we're looking at maybe taking over something that we immediately need to put three million dollars in. Uh, where are we going to get that? Um, I'm not following where you're – are you looking at our um, analysis of no, I, I said, immediate need? I said that oh, I'm sorry. a $3 million equipment that we were going to work through negotiations to try to find it. Oh, I, I'm sorry. On the equipment, Well, yes, we will need to look at some different options there. One of the things um, – that has been helpful at the Muskogee Clinic is entering into lease agreements where you don't have to put out the money all up front. Um, but that is something that I can work with Melissa on. And I guess my last question is, have you decided to just do this? I mean, is that what you're telling us? We've decided to enter into negotiations. And this body has nothing to say about it one way or the other. I would remind everyone that this has to go through not only health committee, but it has to go through rules before. So in answer to your question, I, I think everybody should know that, yes, this body has something to say about it in two different committees. Thank you. I'm sorry. Did I say rules? Executive and finance, my fault. Councilor, I mean, uh, speaker. And, and full council. So there's three things. <laughs> yes, Count, uh, Speaker Fraley. Yes. Uh, on a compact, is it improper or would it be proper for one or maybe two or however many uh, tribal council people to be involved in this negotiation? I think, and I'm speaking for me, I, I think I can speak for the entire negotiation team. We would be pleased to have as many uh, counselors as would like to attend those. Uh, we've got our, uh, an initial meeting. We've been meeting with the area and with Hastings uh, periodically to get information, answer our questions and so forth, and uh, you know, get budget information, staffing information, all of that so we could plan. And uh, we have a next meeting of that uh, scheduled for 20, the 23rd and 24th of April here at the Nation. So uh, certainly inviting counselors that wish to, to attend with us because I think having elected officials at the table also um, uh, tells the Indian Health Service we're serious and, and uh, we want answers to our questions. And so that information usually comes more freely when there's elected officials at the table. So. Oh, I'm sorry, 24th, 25th of April. Mm -hmm. 
some were involved. And certainly if there's a question that you all have that we've not thought of, it's always a good place to raise it because we can just ask it right there on the spot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Councilor Jordan, you had a question? <coughs> This is for Melissa. Yes. Melissa, mm -hmm. other than the three million you've immediately identified, if this transition occurs, will we be getting dollar for dollar what the hospital already received to operate? Will we receive at least that amount? Yes. But we'll still have to worry about this three million. Is there a way that that's going to be negotiated into it? Well, I think it's I think it's possible during our negotiation process that we may be able to identify some resources for that. I just want you to know up front, you know, that, that we haven't done that yet, but we haven't entered into negotiations. So it is possible that we could find some funding for that, that we could enter into some leases for that equipment, because it's made, you know, it's a it's a big piece of equipment. I think the robotics is, is about $900,000. And so there are some options that we had to identify um, how to obtain that. <clears throat> if I could, um, I would just like to point out that a couple of these items on the list, the first one, the robotics, that's to improve the efficiency of the pharmacy. That's to make it operate better. The second one is to add a new service, mammography. So I, I guess what I'm saying is we're zeroing in on this $3 million for equipment, and these are items that need to be negotiated and discussed during the transition, but it's not like we're starting this out $3 million in a hole. That $3 million would allow us from the starting point to provide better services, and improved services. And on the list, the radiology equipment that needs to be replaced sounds like that's the one item that's, it, it's just old worn out equipment that we need to replace. Which can probably be done through leases. Right, and as Melissa said, it can be done through leases. Okay. And then uh, I'm assuming you probably talked or surveyed the current staff regarding the possible transition. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you've had communications with yeah. them. We, um, we, um, let me just clarify. <clears throat> um, when you say survey, I mean, have we sent out a written survey for everybody? No. Um, but Indian Health Service, and it's not us, but Indian Health Service out of Oklahoma area has come down and has invited us to be there and we've had um, um, probably about um, three, four, oh, four to six days of, of various meetings with employees where they just go in and have an open meeting and invite employees to come in. And they've done it on uh, various time frames from 7 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night to make sure they hit all the shifts. Um, and they've been able to come in and ask Indian Health Service questions, ask us questions. And so we've had a very open dialogue and communication process with the employees at Hastings. Now, they're, they're a union. Is that correct? There, there is a union organization within that is a federal union organization membership for employees there that allows membership. Uh, Hastings isn't union and all the employees aren't union, but they do, they do have a federal uh, union bargaining unit there that has membership fees and employees can belong to that, yes. And I understand if they are part of this union, that there is a plan that if they are not if they do not involve themselves in this transition, that there may be substantial amounts that has to be paid out to those individuals. I've heard up to a year uh, in salary for some of those individuals if they are not part of this transition. Um, I'm trying to visualize in my mind what you know, where, what that came, the root of that issue. 
Um, and you guys feel free to jump in from Hastings. But what my response to that is is that that um, that that the payout I think that they're referencing has nothing to do with the union. It has to do with a separation of service. So, for example, if um, um, one of the employees there was eligible to, for fed, to retain their federal service on an IPA and they chose not to, they wanted to resign from Indian Health Service and come over as a tribal hire regardless of whether they're members of the union or not, then they would be paid a um, severance package, what they call a separation benefit, from Indian Health Service that can be as much, I think it's a week for every year of service up to a year. Okay. So I think that might be what they're referring to, but that doesn't have anything to do with the union. Let's say a number of people select that option. Mm -hmm. Does that reduce our no. overall operating funds no. that will that, come to us? No. Indian Health Service has a, a fund called their severance pool, and it's funded. So they would pay that out of their severance pool, and so it, it wouldn't be reduced from the money at Hastings. It appears that they tend to allow their employees, when they sever their relationship from their organization, much better than what we've been allowing some of our employees. But that's just a side comment. <laughs> the other thing I want to ask about is what are we? What do we have? plan-wise for the number of temporary employees that we have there that don't have that protection. Uh, are they going to come over at the same rate of pay, or will there be adjustments in their pay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> what we've looked at is um, um, using the, the same, somewhat of the same precedence that was set with housing authority. And I don't know much about that because I wasn't involved, but I do have a matrix of that. And if if a, there are about um, and and don't quote me on the numbers because I didn't go count them, but I think there's about a hundred and fifty plus temporary employees at Hastings. If if um, there are a few of those, and I want to say about 30 of them that are eligible to go back to permanent with Indian Health Service because they've been permanent before and it's some rule they have. And so we're going to allow them to do that. So that'll take 30 of them off. The remainder, um, we have a human resources team went through and applied them to similar positions at Cherokee Nation and, and looked at their pay and see if it fit within our pay range for that position. Probably um, about 85% of them fit within and so it would just be a, a direct transfer at the same rate if they fit within that range. There were a few um, that was um, 50 cents above the end of our range and we're not going to make a determination on that until after the human resources team recommends that there's no determination on that until after they finish their um, salary survey. I don't know if I have those words right, but human resources in, is in the process of conducting a, um, a nationwide, uh, a Cherokee nationwide um, salary survey schedule to wait and see what those recommendations are because some of those ranges might actually increase some and they would be in that range. So substantially what we're saying is everyone's going to get the same pay? Oh yeah. Everybody will retain their current job. With the same pay? Well, um, I, can't, I can't commit to that right now, but I can tell you that there are only a few of them that didn't fit within our current range. So only the few that didn't fit is the few I can't say that on or make a commitment right now. But some of those ranges may go up and they fit in. But the most any of them were above were, I mean, it was, it was a small amount. It was, um, 
I think the ones I looked at Friday were 50 cents above. So we're an talking, hour. So we're talking a thousand dollars a year would take care of those employees and bring them in at the same range of pay that they're already making. If it was 50 cents on a 2,080 hour year. If it, if it was 50 cents, yes. Yes. Well, I have more questions for you okay. at, the, at the next meeting. You kind of sprung this on us today. But one last note. Uh, I, too, want you to check into the Lost City Community okay. Center equipment because that is named after my dad. So I'm quite concerned that we might take the equipment away that we gave to them. Okay. I'll and I know it is utilized out there in the Lost City community, and they've taken so many hits already. I would hope that we don't. We don't add that on top of their other misery. I will do that. Council Baker and then Councilor Fishinghawk after that. Of, of all those employees you're talking about, <coughs> you said that they can stay federal employees if they want to, but that's just mm -hmm. a few of them. I mean, the temporary, full time, can't, you're, they're not going to stay federal, are they? Well, temporary employees are not eligible for federal. Well, so, out of the temporary pool, which is 150 plus, okay. there was about 30. Of, there's, 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 there's kind of two rules that Indian Health Service, and these are all Indian Health Service rules. But one was that if they were a temporary employee now, but they had been permanent previously, they could convert back to permanent. But so those were allowing to do that if they so choose. With the exception of some of them that were full time, they're all just they don't have a choice. They're just gonna be Cherokee Nation employees. That's correct. Okay. If they weren't eligible And if they're contract employees, then I assume they'll just have to try to contract with the nation. You've got some anesthetists and some yes. different ones yes. that are contract. Yes. Uh, well, there's two things we can do. We can either contract them directly, which is probably what we'll do, I assume. Um, or, you know, we, it is one of those things where we could say, you continue your contract and we'll buy it back. Okay. And uh, so the ones that can stay federal is a fairly small number. The federal employees is actually the maximum number. I mean, number, I mean, out of number six, of people. Yeah, out of 600 people there, um, about 400 and something will be federal. Will be federal. And how long can they stay federal employees under this plan? As long as they want to stay federal employees. Okay. Well, one of the rumors was they're only going to be able to stay federal for two years. Okay. And let me let me tell you the basis of that. Okay. Oh, she gave me the numbers actually. Temporary full time is 136. Okay. Um, Indian Health Service, when they do an, an IPA or um, for federal employment, so they're a federal employee, they do an IP, an interpersonnel agreement to us uh, for them to continue to, to remain federal and stay there. Their rule is that those original IPAs under a special purpose, which is what an assumption is, that their term is for two years. We have, um, and, and they're just automatically renewed. I mean, the only time one, uh, we, have, we have compacted several of our clinics. You know, we did Salison, Stillwell, and Jay. We actually had people retire from federal service on IPAs. We still, I think uh, Cynthia Carley um, was, an, was an IPA and retired out of uh, an IPA and then came on as a tribal hire afterwards. We have an, uh, an IPA now um, that is a dental assistant at Stillwell that's been on IPA for 17 years, I think. So um, the two years thing is coming because the initial term for an IPA because of IHS's regulation is that it is a two year. But, but under an assumption, there is no uh, limit on the, on the times it's renewed. Now, under not an assumption, if we just chose to get an IPA and put them at Stillwell, there is a time limit. It can only be renewed four times, I think. But under an assumption, there's no limit. 
and I assume we're giving them this assurance that they can stay as yes. federal employees. Yes. That has been, you know, one of the things that's been talked about by at by Indian Health Service at all of the meetings. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fishing Hawk. Yes, I got a question. Yes, ma'am. Where Wilma P has so many people over there, they're waiting in line, especially the drop ins. Can I tell them to go over to Muskogee Clinic if they're driving about getting in there quicker? Absolutely. There's no wait over there, are they? They can afford the gas. Oh, true. No. Currently, there is not because they're still. Every week, their patient load gets more and more, but now's a good time to establish care there. Okay. <clears throat> Councilor Jordan. that you would report uh, back to the full body so that some of the questions that have been asked today may we can see answered through the negotiation process. I think probably Melissa's having to speculate a lot now because you're entering into negotiations and those questions will get answered through that process. And if we have uh, some folks at the table, uh, as uh, Melanie has said, that probably will uh, help in those negotiations. And so I would offer that as a motion. I do have a question. You said one of those meetings was the 24th, is that Well, correct? we're having a just a meeting, my, my another point, meeting with Indian Health my Service. My point's going to be is On that April 24th and 25th, our actual negotiation dates are May 5 through 7 and the week of June the 2nd. That's our actual negotiation dates that Indian Health Service has set. And we're trying to have those here in Tahlequah. We have a motion on the floor to form a committee from the council uh, for the purpose of negotiations, uh, to be present at negotiations and report back to the council. Can you repeat the, the members that you requested? It was just my suggestion in consultation with the speaker that we, uh, we would use Meredith Fraley, Bill John Baker, Bradley Cobb, and Jack Baker to act as our representatives if they're available. Unfortunately, the 24th and the 25th, I'm tied up, and the week of May, excuse me, week of May 5th, I'm also have other commitments. Then others that might be open but, during but the if But if I were available, I would be happy to do that. I just think that our eyes and ears, it's very important that we be involved in the actual process as opposed to in the past having been behind the scenes in the process. Let's actually be involved this time and get ahead of the ball game instead of being in the dugout, so to speak. I have a motion on the floor for this subcommittee uh, to report back to the council. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Do we have any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Passes. Um, we'll have the council staff get those dates to everyone mentioned. In the month. Do we have any more questions for Ms. Gower? Thank you. Um, next is old business. I see none. New business. I see none. Announcements. Our next meeting date is tentatively scheduled for May the 13th at 10 a.m. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Councilman Garvin. Uh, this is kind of a special day, and uh, I know some of our elected leaders in Oklahoma City have trouble remembering to file their income taxes. <laughs> and I just want to remind the council to not be guilty like they are, so we're going to take care of that business. Thank you. 
Any other announcements? I would enter a fan in a motion to adjourn. So moved. It's first and it's first and seconded. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. Thank you.